Okay, well, welcome back everybody. That was a great session uh, we just had and we're heading right into our next one. Uh, we'll be hearing from Michelle Shureb um, on designing for resilience, lessons learned from COVID. Michelle is an architect at BDP Quadrangle in Heaven Space with over 25 years of experience. She has worked on projects ranging from Toronto's first mass timber office building at 80 Atlantic to some of the most intricate adaptive reuse projects such as 700 Bay and 130 Bloor Street West. She's a passionate environmentalist setting the green strategy for her firm and I can share from experience in every project uh, that Michelle is involved in. At TEDx Toronto in 2019, Michelle delivered a talk called How Architecture Can Fight Climate Change. I've watched this talk actually a couple of times, Michelle, and uh, I've forwarded it on to a number of friends. So I highly recommend checking that out on, on YouTube following the festival. It's a really nice talk. And so it's with great pride that I pass the virtual mic over to a former SBC board member and a special friend, Michelle. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about resilience. Uh, I'm going to tell you this in sort of three short stories, um, spaces that we've reimagined over the last 18 months in response to the pandemic. So we're going to look at an amenity space, a residential unit, and a hospital. So if there's one thing that the pandemic has brought to light, it is the ability of people and communities to cope, adapt, and respond. And uh, over the next months or years, we're going to continue with our recovery and hopefully start to apply the lessons that we've learned um, sooner rather than later. Ideally, the idea is to minimize the impacts of subsequent shocks and stressors. So in a nutshell, resilience is about our ability to bounce back. And if we take the time to learn from our experience, uh, the idea is to bounce back better. So I've used this diagram, I've used this before. It's a, it's a diagram from Southern Harbor that explains the stages of resilience. So it's charting our performance um, on the Y axis, you've got productivity, and then you've got time on the X axis. So the more resilient a system or a person or a community, the more quickly it returns back to routine after a shock. But I think what's become clearer to all of us is that routine may look a little different after this. And ideally, it looks a bit like that, where our performance has increased. Um, so this idea of building back better. And so a lot of discussions have come out of these last 18 months. And in this, we have started to reimagine and we need to start to internalize this future that we're building and create uh, new routines in the way that we live and we work. And so this means reimagining our better future while gathering our lessons learned and making sure that we pass these along because this is really key. So story number one, reimagining residential amenity. A key attribute of resilient design is redundancy. It's the difference between having a tenuous foothold compared to a robust network that anchors you into position. It's the difference between what the consequences are when one cable breaks. How can this notion of resilient design apply to our infrastructure uh, of our support systems in a way that will help us to recover from stresses brought on by all of this rapid change? And I think first it helps to understand that there's two types of infrastructure and it's really important that these two work together. Although there is a fair understanding of the importance of our hard infrastructure, the importance of our social infrastructure in creating resilient communities is largely overlooked. If you look at this book by Eric Kleinenberg, he talks about uh, the importance of social infrastructure. And he looked at um, kind of the data that came out from this massive heat wave that happened in Chicago. And he found that of all the communities where people died, the majority happened in um, communities that were socioeconomically challenged. Um, he did find this one anomaly with these two communities. And these two neighborhoods are immediately adjacent to each other and they have uh, very similar socioeconomic conditions. And um, for a variety of reasons, Englewood had a decaying public realm and few opportunities for social engagement. Um, and so because this infrastructure wasn't there, people tended to stay home and succumbed to the heat. 
Uh, Auburn aggression, on the other hand, maintained really strong social connections. Uh, people looked out for one another, and it really greatly reduced the death toll in this neighborhood. And again, same socioeconomic conditions, neighborhoods side by side. So what we know is that more bonds create more resilience. And so as designers, the question is, how do we foster the creation of these bonds? And so even given our current circumstances, um, we've been told to physically distance, but really not social distancing. And in fact, it's been even more important to stay socially connected to people. So in Toronto, we've got great existing social infrastructure in our public amenities. So we've got our libraries, we've got our recreation centers. But what would happen if we made a finer grained layer of easily accessible social gathering space throughout our neighborhoods. Think about how much more resilient a network we would have. Um, it seems like we are going to be building housing for a good long time to come. And the question is, are we doing all that we can to build social infrastructure so that we'll actually foster a resilient city? Because right now it seems more like we're building uh, vertical cul-de-sacs. Um, they can provide a sense of privacy and security, but they also tend to foster social isolation. So we believe that there is a real opportunity to create these neighborhood gathering spaces by reimagining the internalized private amenity spaces that we're already providing in new housing. Um, changing them into welcoming open community assets that we can then network to, together to create stronger uh, neighborhood connections. And we call these neighborhood nests. So what are the characteristics of these space? They should be unpretentious and enthusiastically and vigorously welcoming. These spaces really have three physical characteristics. They would need to signal invitations to pause for a moment, to stay for a while, and then reasons to return and enjoy a variety of resources and activities. So well-designed threshold conditions along the public realm send welcoming signals to pause, kind of like eddies in a stream. Sidewalk seat walls provide a casual spot to sit and rest, do some people watching. Movable sitting, seating lets you take ownership of your resting spot. Convenient bike racks give you an opportunity to break up your ride and take a break. And of course, generous canopies are the universal sign for interhere, and they also provide some protection to your seating area. Continuous finishes ease the transition from outside to in, as do large openings for seasonal connections. And plants, of course, blur the transition from inside to out. Providing invitations to stay um, it means providing a variety of places to sit and lounge and interact. So like a big long table where you can sit alone or in a group and have some casual conversation or tall tables where you can sit or stand. Um, the bonus being you can have some quick low pressure encounters with people or soft casual seating where you can have a longer conversation and then little nooks off to the side where you can sit on the periphery of the action. To provide invitations to come back, the design really needs to be flexible enough for a variety of activities, like providing beverages, like coffee, a natural recurring social event. It can be a place for a neighborhood resource library or a games activity library. Opportunities to announce changing neighborhood events. And it can also host events like a book club or a house concert. It can be a place that fosters healthy eating and local produce by supporting a farmer's market. It can be flexible and inclusive space, uh, welcoming to people um, uh, of, of, of all genders, abilities and disabilities so that everyone is really invited to participate. So this flexible design provides opportunities to create spaces to accommodate a variety of needs and a lot of different activities so everyone can find their special place in it. And all of these elements help to create a wonderfully inviting neighborhood social space. And so what it really needs now is a welcoming presence. And we think of this person as a curator. So where many residential buildings have a security guard, this position could be rethought of as a security uh, as, a, as a curator, someone whose job it is to be more inclusive um, 
more like a facilitator. Maybe they, they greet people, provide information, serve coffee, clean things up, an activities coordinator, conflict negotiator, with a different job description where this person's role is really to engage and share and connect people together. And so now we have both the physical attributes and the human touch for a wonderfully inviting neighborhood space. And meanwhile, in the background, we can integrate a robust hard infrastructure of backup services. The space itself can have passive design strategies in mind, high performance walls and windows, a canopy for passive shading, a robust communication network is really key. And of course, emergency power for air conditioning and a high quality um, air quality system. Refrigeration for medical supplies and other essentials, as well as a continuous backup water supply. And so now together, these things create a really strong support system. So that when an extreme event comes along, like a blackout or an ice storm, a resilient network of hard and social infrastructure is in place to allow us to flex under stress. Neighborhood nests can transition into nodes where we can gather to take shelter, plan next steps, and coordinate emergency provisions and pool our resources. Or even when physical distancing is appropriate, like right now. While we know this is key, the idea is to stay connected. So messages can start to take many forms. They can be simple, informative, supportive, and necessary. The space could be used to facilitate essential services like food delivery, with strong communication networks for outreach. And the system might even be able to go remote to have a remote curator facilitating community connection. So that once the stressful conditions start to dissipate, the flexible design of these neighborhoods can facilitate recovery at a pace that works, where people can start to stand, plan next steps for an appropriate re-entry. Starting to reintegrate some core activities, hosting smaller social events, and establishing a new routine. And since change is all around us, we think that these resilient places are essential to fostering strong community that we need to recover and respond. Story number two, reimagining residential. In 2018, in the United Nations estimated that 55% of the global population lived in urban areas and that by 2050, this is gonna increase to 68%. And in many urban centers, like here in Toronto, the increased demand for housing has driven up land value and construction costs. And as these costs have increased, the average size of residential units has been decreasing to keep things affordable. Here in Toronto, a two bedroom plus den in an older building might be about a thousand square feet, while in new buildings, we're looking at more like 750. And this squeezing of floor plans has actually reached a breaking point where we're being asked to make them even smaller than this. And these units can only be tightened so much without sacrificing the quality and functionality of space. After all, a bedroom still has to fit a bed. And so if every room is completing for area, we need to really get creative. And the pandemic experience has really given us some direct understanding of the specific desires of what an improved at-home wellness experience might be. So part of optimizing flexibility, we started to ask the question, what would happen if we reduced or, or eliminated the set program of a residential unit? What if we blurred the lines between rooms rather than delineating them with demising walls? So starting with the, the structure, it seems obvious to go to a, to a column grid with optimal spacing, allowing for potential redemising over the lifespan of a building. Moving our fixed infrastructure to the, to the uh, hallway wall, all of our mechanical plumbing, so bathrooms, kitchens, and laundry consolidated on the perimeter. So freeing up the space in between. Integrating our mechanical distribution into the floor uh, to eliminate awkward bulkheads that kind of get in the way of having a flexible plan. And with a raised floor system, there's the added possibility for in-floor storage spaces, uh, which are re really great for stowing away per, uh, seasonal items. And then this increased floor to floor, if you combine this with your smaller, more flexible units, actually results in more units um, in total. 
And to make the best use of this unit's free plan, we're proposing these movable partition modules uh, to replace the static walls. So designed with integrated functionality, the module's flexibility allows users to change the space according to their needs and um, whatever they happen to be doing in that space. So prefabricate, these would be prefabricated off-site by manufacturers, um, reducing time on site, saving valuable time. Over time, residents can rearrange or replace just the modules as their needs change. And the modules can offer the possibility of changing spatial divisions throughout a day. So parents can be working while kids are playing in a separate space. Uh, work and play can then be tucked away when the day is over and the space becomes open for a family room. In another unit, modules are shifted over to allow a multi-generational family to gather for a meal, while in smaller areas, uh, it starts to create a smaller nook for one-on-one -on -one interactions. And then as the sun sets, built-in beds can be lowered into place and partitions extended to offer some privacy and acoustic separation. And then the same concept applies uh, with a blur blurred program to a unit's outdoor space. So providing a semi-conditioned sun bay allows an extension of the inside out or the outside in. It can be fully enclosed to extend the growing season of plants or to safely store other items from the cold. Um, it could be semi-enclosed like a front porch, offering residents a private sheltered space to extend their outdoor space. And by screening the wind and providing shade, it also provides a comfortable outdoor space for a number of different activities. Balconies extend beyond the sun bays and really act as staggered yards, a more exposed space where residents can connect with one another, fostering a vertical community. Um, one of the unique characteristics of living in multi-unit residential rather than single family. To further optimize the sense of community, the unit's front door is recessed. An adjacent side light lets you know if anybody's home, animates the corridor. Inside the front door, a wide entry includes an area for packages and can act as a sanitation station if needed. And so our, really our immediate experience um, experiences of COVID have proven that multi-unit residential units really need to take on greater functionality. And by thinking of them as parts of a micro community and changing our approach to their design and construction, we can now really continue to offer these small units at affordable prices while actually creating more valuable, con convenient living spaces. Story number three, reimagining the hospital. So in March of 2020, while most of us were really being sent home to work, our colleagues in the UK were invited to roll out temporary hospitals across the UK in response to the anticipated bed shortage for COVID patients. And they developed a prototype from which they delivered six hospitals with 11,500 fully, ho fully functional hospital beds across the UK. And they delivered the first two in just under two weeks. And so I'm gonna take you through the very first one, the prototype which is that first week. So on March 17th, our colleagues in the UK received a call asking them to put together a description of the building characteristics that would be required for a temporary hospital and to list out some of the potential buildings that might fit the bill. Two days later, uh, they were informed that their convention center, the Excel, was the site that had been selected and it's an absolutely huge space. It's 88 meters wide by 500 meters long and has a, a long central corridor. Uh, this was the first briefing where the army arrived with a team of engineers and began to organize the team. So a first for us. On Monday, March 20th, the team from BDP arrived at the Excel Center and you can see here just how large this space is. This is only about a third uh, the size of the hall. And this right here, this innocuous item, this was key to making the space work. Um, these are service boxes, which are spaced in a four meter grid on a raised floor. And each one of these boxes has a uh, capacity for drainage, for data cabling, water supply, and power. And it was really this flexible infrastructure that made this space work. So here we are still on the first day. Um, this is around 11 a.m. Our team was tasked with creating a layout for how they might uh, roll out the first 500 be beds. And they were given uh, one hour to produce this drawing. Seems pretty crazy. And so here they are projecting the plan. There were no printers on site, so they had to project it onto the wall. 
Um, and then this was the plan that was agreed to in principle by lunchtime on the Monday. And so then they had to try to organize the list of issues and work streams. And so they did this by, with, by pinning things up on the wall so that they could quickly flag issues and identify risks and figure out what the barriers might be and sort of identify the critical path items, what needed to be ordered. At the same time, they were starting to think about how the services might, might um, get into the headboards of the beds from the floor boxes. And this is a sketch of the first thoughts around that. You can see them coming up in behind. And the idea was to use the framing from the, um, the exhibition spaces. And I'll tell you more about that. So by the end of the day on Monday, they had a layout. This showed the first 500 beds and the dots represent the floor boxes. So our team went home, took a little nap, came back and by the next day they came in and uh, the people on site had already started pulling the cables in and as well as some of the piping on site. So they immediately produced these drawings. Uh, the dots on the plan identify which services needed to come up at which floor box to help the team on site understand what they were trying to do. Um, up until this time, uh, everything was really pretty abstract, um, but people were moving into action incredibly quickly. So medical gases needed to be put in, uh, a whole network needed to be installed from the underground parking below. Um, here we are, on, uh, here's the team on day one. Our team had proposed the idea of using the exhibition stands that I mentioned, this is what it looks like. And when they got there, they had already brought a whole bunch of it onto site and the team immediately put up a mock-up of a prototype and you can see the bed marked out there on the floor with tape. And here they are um, speaking with the medical team and really getting sign off on that first day to move ahead with the design. Meanwhile, in parallel, the lighting team was back at the office sorting out the lighting design. They, it was really important that they get this sorted out as quickly as possible because they had to order um, a thousand light fixtures and they had to do this immediately before there were any kind of uh, glitches in the supply chain. Um, the next day, they started looking at the ventilation system. Um, the idea was to maximize the amount of ventilation in the systems in the space. Uh, luckily, it had these great high ceilings and the capacity for a lot of air. And the Army was really helpful in this respect. Um, at this point, patients in hospitals were sitting in beds and hallways, and the Army was able to remind our team that even though the space wasn't designed for a hospital, um, it had all the right components, and the idea was that any, th any time that we could save would save lives. And this could be good, things could be good enough. And this was really a shift in mindset for professionals who are used to thinking about things on a more permanent basis, especially for something like a hospital. So this is the end of day two. They're laying out the floor, laying down the floor, the bed bays are going up really quickly. Um, there were some huge uh, medical gas tanks. So this is the oxygen tank that had to be accommodated. And so our structural engineer rushed over on his bike designed the pad for the tank on site and they were quickly poured because um, they had to harden in time for the rest of the tanks to arrive. The electrical was interesting because we had to use the existing underfloor infrastructure that I showed you and then we had to cut in uh, the UPS for the backup generators to give the resilience to the space that was required. This is day four so you can see just how quickly things are taking, taking shape. Lots and lots of meetings. So the Army set up a meeting pattern. So one in the morning, one in the evening. And these were where you had to come in and report and make sure everyone knew what was going on. Because you had people out purchasing things. You had people building things. And through this, uh, the Army was really very good at reporting what was key and what wasn't. And our team learned a lot about how to streamline their communication and make decisions extremely quickly. Uh, this is what they call a rock drill. They taped out the whole facility on the floor and had the medical team there to rehearse how the hospital would really work. Um, it was very time consuming, but incredibly effective of helping people understand. So this is one week in. Uh, this is the Monday. By this point, one of our team members had gotten COVID. Um, we were realizing that one of the things we needed to do was very quickly communicate what we'd learned in our first week on site um, out to other teams who were doing this all across the country. I mean, we even had teams calling us from around the world uh, to understand how we were doing this. And this was an in information poster that was used to brief as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. A really big difference from the way we're used to working with huge hospital procurement documents that tend to be thousands and thousands of pages. 
And this is the diagram uh, for the outside. So looking at deliveries and traffic, fire safety, generator security. Um, there was also press everywhere trying to get the details of what was going on. So you can start it, see it starting to look like a hospital, at least from the front. Um, and then here are, this was actually the critical path item. These are the medical air compressors. Um, and they were fact, these are usually take about six weeks to manufacture and they put these together for us within a week and brought them to site. And here you can see the first ward fully outfitted, ready to go by the end of day nine, starting to train people. The biggest issue was actually getting enough staff to work the wards rather than the, the building itself. And then here's the first patient arriving and here's that first patient leaving. So there's the good news. So some key takeaways that we got from this. Um, fostering social connection is key to building community resilience, whether it's food, art, people, safety, movement, creating reasons to pause, gather and return. Redundancy and adaptability are key attributes of resilience, both hard and social infrastructure. And using this opportunity to question the status quo, I think is really, really key. Flexible infrastructure makes adaptation possible. And then capture the lessons learned in a really tangible way immediately and pass these lessons on um, so to increase our collective knowledge and build resilience for whatever comes next. And finally, working across disciplines is what is required to solve some of the biggest issues of our day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, so many thoughts rolling through my head. Um, uh, we'll take maybe one question and then we'll um, we're heading over to an interactive coffee session, so maybe we'll we'll hop over there. Um, in, incredible to see something different happen out of, of COVID and seeing uh, the way the team was able to move so quickly. Looking at some of the drawings that were coming out after day seven, uh, that would be month seven if you were building uh, via many other uh, procurement models, at least in my experience. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to, to capture some of these lessons and maybe apply them as we go forward? I think part of it is actually taking the time to stop. I think everyone was such an, in such a panic trying to kind of keep their teams moving, keep teams working that it's sometimes you just, you're just dealing with your day to day and moving that forward. But I think really taking those moments to stop, pause, regroup because they just, they learned so much in such a short period of time. And then I think I look back at what we did through the pandemic and, you know, this has been a long learn, but some things we learned incredibly quickly. And so making sure you're capturing that and finding a way to constantly be learning because, you know, the pandemic is, you know, it's, it's one blip, but, you know, with, with climate change, anything can happen at any time. And so having the ability to pivot and sort of be nimble um, is really quite key. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, that's an interesting opportunity for lesson learned right there. Like how how nimble that that team was, and thinking about some of the challenges we're about to face with respect to climate change. Like we, we'd be smart to to prepare to be prepared to be nimble for those changes that I think are rather inevitable. Well, it's interesting because that first project that I talked about, the amenity space we were originally working on that before COVID and we were thinking about it as a place of adaptation in case of climate change, um, kind of a resiliency center was the, was the idea. And we knew it needed to be a space that was in people's sort of day-to-day -day lives to be effective. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we were about to roll it out, the pandemic hit and we had to sort of look at it with a new lens and say, is this still, is this still a value at a time where we're talking about being a part would this space still have value? And we, we concluded that it most definitely would. Yeah, maybe like greater value. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for a great session. I uh, re really appreciated it. Um, the program is now heading into today's uh, second interactive coffee break. And 